Hey everyone, thank you for joining us for today's Digital Making at Home live stream. Uh, if you haven't already, say hello in the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from this week. I'm Mr. C, coming to you live from Cambridge as always. Uh, and with me as a special guest host this week is the awesome Rebecca. How's it going, Vic? Hi everyone, I'm joining from near Birmingham in the UK. And thank you to everyone for joining us from your homes all over the world. Uh, today is going to be really awesome because we've got two guests from Brown Bag Animation Studios joining us today and they're going to be chatting about some amazing films and TV shows like Vampirina, Octonauts and my favourite which is Doc McStuffings and also their new project called Angela's Christmas Wish. Amazing, I know a few of those shows, I'm a bit, not me obviously, like I don't watch Octonauts but the boys did when they were You do, you do. <laughs> Super shame that. So, lots of people in the chat really early on today. It was really great to see Henry from Ottawa chiming in, coding for kids, Iraq. Great to see everyone getting involved quickly. We're really excited to have everybody along. Thank you for being part of the audience. So, Rebecca, one thing you might not know is that every week we try to find something cool about technology that's going on and kind of share it with the audience. So, okay. guess what this week. Right, go on, tell me. Right, so, if you're thinking about launching a rocket into space, right, like you want to get some of your stuff up to space uh, on yep. the, to the International Space Station, what way would you point your rocket? Uh, upwards, going up. Right, yes. Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. Right? <laughs> and then you've got to deal with all this gravity and stuff, and there's a whole bunch of other things you have to overcome. Physics becomes like really painful. But yep. Virgin Orbit just launched a rocket into orbit sideways. Right, horizontally wow. off the back of this massive plane. Right, so this is a modified 747 called Cosmic Girl. You can see here it detaches the little rocket payload to go into space, and then the rocket on that little payload kicks in, and then that thing just whoosh shoots off into orbit, and it can then deliver stuff to the space station or whatever we want it to do. Right? That is amazing. Super cool, yeah. Like, and so they can do heaps of these little slingshot launches. If you think the plane is already moving, the rocket has already got a really nice bit of speed on, and they just wham that gas on the back of it and off it goes, right? So much less effort using the slingshot of the plane behind it. It's just, it's very clever. It's gonna change the way we deliver things to space. I thought that was really that, cool. So does that mean that they can launch rockets from pretty much anywhere now if we can launch them from planes? Pretty much as long as the conditions are right, yeah. You can launch them from anywhere in the world as long as you've got a runway that you can get that 747, you can launch things into space. That's pretty cool. Really cool, right? And so for those of you who are new like Rebecca, welcome. Digital Making at Home is all about getting young people like you coding and creating with technology. Every week we chat with cool people like we do today. Uh, we code together and we see amazing digital making projects from all over the world. We're broadcasting right now to YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and Twitch. Uh, and we're able to see your comments and we can hear from you. So make sure to like and subscribe. Uh, go to rpf.io slash sub to subscribe. Or you can just click the subscribe button if you're on YouTube or Twitch. Uh, and shout outs to Alicia Nash, Alan Cameron uh, and Lalitha Param, some of our newest subscribers. So thanks for being part of Team Raspberry Pi, guys. Hi. Hey, should we bring in Damien and Richard now and have a chat with them? Yeah, yeah, let's go for it. Fellas, are you there? Hi. Hello. How are you? Hi, everyone. Oh, I have to say, that rocket is amazing. The rocket we just saw. Something so else. Cool, right? Oh, so clear. Like the science we're pulling off now is just brilliant. It's amazing. Yeah. It was a bit like, but we can storyboard. They <laughs> 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 can over the moon and we can storyboard. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's got different skills, man. You exactly, know, like, exactly. I can't lift incredibly heavy weights, but I can like code stuff and make robots. You know, so. right, right. But that, so, speaking of that, speaking of being able to storyboard and doing those things, you guys work for Brown Bag Animation Studios, right? Yeah, that's right. Brown, Brown Bag based in Dublin. Um, that's, that's wicked. Well, it's, actually okay. spread Sorry, over, it's spread all over the world at this stage. It's it's got offices in Dublin. Um, I think there's a office studio in Bali as well, and then a studio in Toronto. So it's a, it's a pretty big organization. That's awesome. And so when so you've got them spread all over the world, obviously they, those different offices would be working on different projects and sorts of things. And what is it that you guys do for Brown Bag? Richard, over to you. You can, you can start off there. That's cool. Um, my title is a CG supervisor, but what I actually do is a technical director. So basically I direct everything technical. Um, it's probably not as technical as rocket science like we just saw, but CG and computer graphics is quite complicated and it's ever evolving and um, software is always changing. So we're trying to keep up with the time. So basically, you know, Damien would direct the creative side where I would direct the technical side. So if Damien wanted a, a robot that transforms into a giraffe, I have to technically figure out how we would do that within the scope of the show and work with the departments to make that happen technically, basically. 
That's really cool. So those were your responsibilities in production and things like that. I mean, the difference between creative and technical, could you just sort of go into that a little bit for me? Because I find that quite interesting, the idea that there's two sets of direction on any given animation or thing like that. Yeah, I, I could I could certainly dive in on the, the creative side if you want and, and explain how we kind of work together on it. So um, I'm a writer director in Brown Bag, so I the stuff that sort of Richard looks after, I have a kind of overview knowledge of, but nothing close to a really deep knowledge like, like Richard would have. So as Richard alluded alluded to there, uh, if I wanted a, a robot to become a giraffe, if I wrote that, I would kind of in the back of my head know that might be very, very complicated. Um, the good news is, is if we're writing and directing our own projects, um, which we do occasionally in there, uh, I can kind of use my, my basic knowledge of the technology to kind of help and assist the story. So I wouldn't be writing anything too crazy, or at least I could cut away for anything really complicated on camera, which would make Richard's life a little bit easier. If we're doing client work um, and the client says, look, you know, we absolutely have to see this thing happen on camera as a story point, um, whether it be, you know, water, pouring water, or maybe fire is really complicated, then I will board it and, 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 uh, and plan it out with the creative team. And then we would hand over to Richard, who would advise us the best way possible to achieve it in a computer. Interesting. Okay. So you then, it's interesting. I never considered that the creative side would have to have that consideration for the technical side. It was always the way I thought it was. It's like, this is what we need. Go make it happen. But it's not that way, Richard. That's not really the way it works. It's a two-way street, really. We always work together, <clears throat> and I would try to envisage, you know, Damien's direction. But you know, we do have to kind of work hand in hand. Damien would be aware that there are limitations, so he wouldn't, you know, in within the scope of the show. If there's a shot with say 100 people, Damien would have that knowledge to know. Listen, we can't have 100 people in every shot. We can scale it down to something more realistic, like 10 people in every shot. So his knowledge is, you know technical as well but we do work hand in hand to get the best result out of the show basically everyone wants to make it look beautiful but there are limitations and budgets like everything but we have to make it work with what we can do and um, but there's always ways and means to make that work you know there's cheats and there's there's various different amazing pieces of software and technology that we can make things work for what Damien wants. So I'm not always the person who says no, I'm typically the person who always says yes, unless I really need to say no. <laughs> yeah, same. I know. It's a very, good, a very good way of putting it. The way I always look at it is, if I went to Richard and said, um, I absolutely want 100 people in this shot, you know, charging over a mountain and running through water, uh, Richard could probably give me that, but then the rest of the show is probably gonna suffer. <laughs> Um, it's going to be fairly basic looking from that moment on because I've already burnt the budget and schedule and exhausted the team with this one brilliant shot. So that's very much where working in tandem comes because I say, what if we showed a hint of it? And then we showed little hints in lots of other nice places and made the whole thing look awesome. So that's generally how it works. Very interesting. So that's sort of part of making sure that the budget fits and you can string that along and create a whole storyboard that looks good from beginning to end instead of blowing everything in like five seconds worth of incredible yeah. CGI. Interesting. And that's really cool. And so you worked together on Angela's Christmas Wish very recently. Um, what was that like? What sort of things did you work together? How did you have your responsibilities mesh in that production? So on um, that one, what was interesting is I wrote it. So because I was writing it, I could write it and sort of say, you know what, we we can contain this element here. Or in earlier meetings, there's a very big intricate dock sequence that, that happens, a big action sequence in a docks. So very early on, I could say, look, this is coming and it's going to be really big and, and tricky to do. Um, and then Dickie could say, that's great. Maybe don't have X, Y, and Z, uh, if possible. You know, limit the shots where we see full water. Or maybe don't have waves coming from the boats as they leave. So all of this stuff is really important to know. Uh, but similarly, I could do, I mean, there's a, a conversation that takes place in a park. I could have done that conversation over five or six different locations. Um, but that would have caused a massive amount of work for the lighters and for, for Richard and for several other people. So we could just say, well, we could just do it in one location. And again, we can make that work. Um, but yeah, it was it was a very complex uh, production. It was a very short schedule to make it. And obviously, we had a, an unmovable deadline of Christmas. So you can't move Christmas. So we had to have to, have to deliver it. So from a creative side, that, that was really how I approached the technical marriage. Very interesting. So you start with a screenplay 
and then that was the story that you wrote and I'd like to see these things on screen and you sort of think about how that might be practical and then what's the next step for you after you've got a story and it's all there what's the next thing you would sort of get them to do well I would I would uh, somewhat hesitantly kind of give the script to Richard and, and then Brian Richard reads it and comes back to me and says, <laughs> have you lost your mind? <laughs> this is massively complicated. So I would give him the script, um, I would let him digest it. And then uh, when he comes back to me, I can then do my pitch and say, it sounds really complicated, but honestly, we won't have cloth dynamic, which will help, or we won't have full water fluidity, which will help. And, uh, and then really it's just a case of um, getting the biggest bang for our bucks. Uh, would that be a fair assessment, Richard? Yeah, I think that's pretty good, actually. I mean, what I would do is I would break down the script. It's called breaking the script down. So I would read the first draft of the script. There'd be several drafts of the script which would progress from writing the story and figuring it all out. But <clears throat> every draft, I'd break it down. So I'd figure out how many characters are needed, how many props are needed, how many sets are needed, how much effects is needed. Um, and I would work with Damien to say, listen, this is actually coming out quite high. Can we reduce some of the crowd shots so we don't have so many wide shots in a scene? Um, but I always think of you know storytelling as important for the story and not necessarily showing off technical amazing effects. If you think about the you made the best sitcoms like Friends, you know they they only show two sets and they don't show big wide panoramic scenes of New York. They don't need to. It's all about story, story, story. So it's not always about better is more effects. Better is better storytelling, really. So you know it's not always about the technical side. That's really interesting because like. I, I absolutely love watching animated films and I just don't think about all of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. It just sounds like such an incredible job to do and an amazing sort of piece of work as well. Um, is there any, are there any other projects that our viewers might be interested in that you've been involved with? Um, well, yeah, I've, I actually worked through quite a lot of projects um, in Brambag. I've been in Brambag now for, I think, 11 years. So over those 11 years, I worked on going way back, Noddy, which is an older uh, show that we yeah. did, Olivia, Olivia the Pig, which is based on the books, Olivia the Books. Um, then I came back on season one, episode one of Doc McStuffins, um, which was the pilot. And I was on Doc McStuffins for seven years. So um, I know that show very, very well. I uh, worked as a retake supervisor on Doc McStuffins. So basically my job there was to make sure that the fixes we would need towards the end of production um, were, I guess, animated and lit correctly and also solved any of the problems that we would have flagged. So um, those retakes then get slotted into the, the final the final production. I then worked on storyboards um, and I moved around from a few different shows. I was on Henry Huggermonster, Peter Rabbit. I'm going to forget those now. Uh, Octonauts. I did a bit on the Octonauts. And then when I came off, Doc McStuffins, after my seven years, I moved on to Angela's Christmas for Netflix as co-writer and director on that. Um, and then Butterbeans Cafe for Nickelodeon, I was series director on that. And then the one we just discussed would be the most recent. So yeah, I, I've, I've kind of had many fingers in many pies over the years. <laughs> that is a lot of productions. So yeah. should you have these storyboards and what's next in making an animated film? Go ahead, Damien. No, I was I was basically going to say, yeah, the storyboards, um, we get the storyboards in, we make sure they're okay and they do what they need to do. And then we basically give them up to an edit suite and the editor actually builds uh, what's called an animatic. So they time the storyboards out to the actor's dialogue. Um, and basically at the end of the animatic process, it should be around about 11 or 12 minutes, depending on the runtime. And we basically edit that animatic, we reboard sections that we need to reboard and we keep at that many, many, many times, um, depending on the production, many times. And then once that's done and locked, we ship it to the animation studio, which would be Bali in most cases, which is where Brown Bike have a studio. We ship it over with a lot of detailed notes about how they achieve it and the animation to match the, the, um, the actual animatic. To give you an idea of how many times we do it, on Angela's Christmas, I think we had 120 versions of the animatic that we would have edited. Each one is half an hour long, so you can imagine we, we see it many, many, many times. But each time we edit it and, and fix it, it's the cheapest, quickest way of improving the, the production because animation is very expensive, whereas pencil and paper and redrawing, it is expensive, but nowhere near as expensive as full CG. So it's a real luxury in animation that we get to um, actually watch the film really before we make it. We sort of edit it before we start making it, and then we know we're only going to animate 
the bits we're going to use. So there's very little wastage at the at the expensive end. Yeah, like I've I've actually made a few very small minor animations in Blender, and it takes probably about five minutes just to render just a tiny short mm. clip. How long do you reckon it took to ren render Angela's Christmas wish? <laughs> if you if you added all the frames and all the render time, you'd be talking years, pretty much. Oh, wow. We have what's called a render farm. So if you're rendering a shot, that's. 100 frames long you can distribute that to multiple machines so you'd have you could have 100 machines rendering that so they would take a frame and you know not every computer not one computer is trying to render the whole shot but you'd have a farm of computers rendering it overnight but we actually have a render budget would you believe so the render budget that we had to aim for for Angela's Christmas wish was two hours per frame so that was like our bar but some frames took 10 minutes half an hour some frames went over three hours depending on how complex the scene is so the rendering time was tried to be on average two hours which is quite a long time um, but it was high production yeah and then it's 24 frames just just for people don't it's 24 frames per second so you can imagine if this one frame takes three hours, 24, three hours gives you one second of, of watch screen time. Um, I remember, I think close-ups took longer to render than, than wide shots. So I remember at some stage in the production, it was sort of, do we, could we pull back on the close-ups maybe and uh, keep it more medium <laughs> wide <laughs> just to speed up the render times? Because again, the, the deadline can't move. So yeah. That's amazing. And is the render farm on the cloud or is that in-house? It's in-house. We have our own render farm in Dublin, but we pretty much do most of the rendering, as Damien alluded to, with the animation studio abroad. So Bali would have their own in-house huge render farm. But if it spills over, there's capabilities of using the cloud as well. But it's pretty much their local render farm. They have full control of it. That's really cool. Super yeah. interesting. But it's interesting when you think about it, that we would have multiple final passes. We call them HD passes. But you'd see it in HD and we would review it and go, we need to fix X, Y, and Z. So you, you know, you're doing multiple renders. So once you render it once, it's not finished. We'll have to tweak it multiple times before it's absolutely finished. So you might render the one frame four or five times before it's approved. Amazing. Okay. An interesting knock-on effect of that is when, you, when you're working in animation, it, animation generally looks terrible at every stage. It's like, it looks terrible, looks terrible, looks terrible, looks terrible. And then they click the switch and render it, and it looks amazing. Um, so we spend an inordinate amount of time looking at sort of gray, ugly versions of the final product. Um, we're all used to it, but it is interesting when someone who isn't used to it comes on. Um, whether it be a client or a, you know a, a producer, say on a, on one of our own shows, and they could come on and sort of go, "Wow, is it going to look like this?" And you're like, "No, no, bear with this." And then right at the end of production, it comes back lit, beautiful, gorgeous, stunning, and and that's what you see on TV. Obviously, because like manipulating it, then you've got that sort of um, the processing power you would need to sort of have that in your computer being full color, full render all the time would be huge. I mean, could you render your animation on a Raspberry Pi? Is that would that be possible? Or would that just be inordinately long? It's, I mean, there's different rendering techniques and there's different approaches. You know, you can, you could think of using Raspberry Pi, but we have actual renderers that we would decide to use on the show when you're limited to that. Like we rendered Angela's Christmas Wish on Arnold. We use V-Ray on other shows, different approaches. We're looking at GPU rendering versus CPU rendering. There's all different techniques and the software is always changing. Um, but it depends on the, the style and the of the show. But typically, brown bag use V-Ray, if anyone is aware of that. That's our renderer of choice. There's multiple renderers, but we have chosen V-Ray, and it, it works really well. Um, but it's, it's all about understanding the rendering and being knowledgeable of your tools, basically. So V-Ray works really well for us, and we're using more and more GPU rendering, which is much, much quicker. Awesome. You don't quietly mind Bitcoin on the weekend when no one's using the computers or anything, do you? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And more and more more and more shows more and more shows are 4K nowadays. So you're like if you think of a HD frame, it's actually four times that amount. So one frame is actually now four times longer to render. But with GPU and everything else, render times are coming down. So it's always a always a balance. That's crazy. That's really I'm, cool. I'm really excited to get going with these storyboards. You're gonna you're gonna give us some lessons now, Damien, so it can become awesome animators now. All right. So before I do, I usually, I'll be honest, I usually spend anything from a day to two days to teach storyboarding. So I am going to puree all of that down in 10 <laughs> minutes. All right. So you're, uh, it's really tip of the iceberg stuff. Uh, <laughs> but let's give it a go. Yeah, let's give it a go. I knocked these up this afternoon. So hopefully they will look okay. 
All right, so I believe that's us. Oh, yeah, uh, good. Okay, now let's see. Oh, there we go. There was a bit of a delay. So these are obviously the shows we've worked on. We kind of discussed those, so I won't go back through. Just interestingly, before I dive in, Brand Mag also do a lot of short films. Um, just for those who don't know, short films are a brilliant way to kind of hone skills and also to hone the technology. So if we ever want to try anything out, again, shorts are a good way to do it. So these are some of the shorts that the, the guys have done um, over, the, over the years. And then storyboarding. So as I alluded to earlier in the conversation, the real benefit of storyboarding is we it's a cheap and efficient and good way to basically make sure the story is working, okay? And it's also a way of getting the written word on the script and basically doing what I call a visual rewrite of it because interesting thing about watching TV or watching a film, we can all understand the language of cinema. So when we see a close-up or a, a long shot or we cut into someone talking, we can all understand that when we hear it. But when you go to speak it, which is really what storyboarding is, it's very difficult. Uh, all of a sudden, you're looking at a blank page going, what do I do here? How, how do I even do it? I suppose the best way to sort of demonstrate this is to, I'll talk you through the process using a script and a story that most people are familiar with. Um, so this is how it all starts. Uh, I would just get my three blank squares on a page like this, and then I would have my script. And the script we're going to use today is Humpty Dumpty, which is a fascinating story. It's a meditation on an egg and how that egg uh, decides. I don't really know why he falls off the wall. I've never really gone into that plot point. So it is tricky, actually. When I teach um, storyboarding, the kids always come back to me and they're like, why does he fall off the wall? And I'm, I'm, I have no idea. Interestingly as well, they never actually state he's an egg. So there you go. So um, that's the other thing. Most most kids will just draw an egg. Um, but yeah, depending, depending on my mood, I can come back to them and go, why did you choose an egg for Humpty Dumpty? Yeah, I, wonder um, that, I wonder how that came about. It must be a very old story, like fairy tale book that had an egg character drawn in it for some reason and it just stuck. I it must have been. I, I, I would say that uh, a producer somewhere said eggs are easy to rig and build. So, <laughs> just make him an egg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can render an oval really fast. It's fine. Yeah, exactly. And the storyboard artist will thank you too. I can tell you that. If it's an egg, brilliant. Um, so in Humpty Dumpty, Humpty Dumpty sat in a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. So uh, like I was saying, the problem with storyboards is you have unlimited choices, right? So if we saw this film or, or short film, we would immediately just watch it and go, yeah, we got that. We understand it. But if you, if I said to somebody, take this written word, and draw it up. Suddenly what happens is you think, well, I can put the camera anywhere. Um, I could literally do anything. I could start in a close up and put wide, a uh, hundred different options. So the simplest way to get around that is to do what most productions do. Um, and that is start on a wide shot. Um, so you just start in wide. The reason you start in a wide is it's called an establishing wide. And the benefit of the establishing wide is um, oh, the cursor works, is obviously you give all the information and the geography of the world, or as much of it as you can fit in. So when we see this, we kind of go, right, we've got a wall, an egg, a hill, and because we know the king's horses and men are going to be coming in later on, we, we can also introduce the castle in the background. So this gives us everything we kind of need to know. Now, the next thing, and it's, I guess this is why they call it directing, is you now need to tell the audience what is important in this vista. So you go in on the egg, right? This is cutting from our wide to our medium. So it's wide, medium. Now we're in on the medium. This lets the audience at home know that fella on the wall, he's important. If you think about it, and I'll demonstrate this later, I'm just jumping back now, but if the castle was the main plot point, if it was Humpty Dumpty and it was more about the king's horses and men, we would actually cut into a medium on the castle. The castle. Uh, yeah, so we cut in on the egg and that is directing the audience to go, Mr. Egg is important, okay? Now, while we're on this medium, we can do a very limited performance because I did knock these up uh, before this call. So the egg would be sitting here and he's looking around, you know, he's like, oh, I'm on a wall, okay? So he realizes he's on a wall. Now, let's punch in to get some of the expression and interest across. So now we go into our close-up. And that medium, uh, or sorry, wide, medium, close-up formula is a lot, an awful lot of productions and films get made with that basic rule. Um, like all rules, you can throw it out later on once you, you're, you're fluent in the language or whatever, you can dismiss it. But if you are starting out, uh, going wide, medium, close-up is a really, really good way to, to just get into the story. So now we've got our egg. We're in the close-up on the egg, so we know he is the important element, not the wall, not the ground, but the egg. And he, again, he's looking around, he's realised now he's stuck on this wall, so he looks forward, that's fine. So 
The other thing we're doing with storyboards is you're getting a little bit of a performance in. You gotta understand that this is gonna to go to an animator overseas. And the animator overseas will use this as their starting point, as their opening template. So they'll go, oh, egg leans forward here. Sometimes the animation can be a literal translation of the performance in the storyboard. Sometimes the animators will go the sort of take take it as a as a blueprint and go the extra mile on it and inject some more acting into it. And that's always what we're looking for. They say that animators are shy actors, and it, it's a really good description. We we want we want an animator to to really wonder how this egg is feeling and just really get that across in the performance. But where possible in storyboards, try and give it as much information as possible. So now we lean forward a bit too much and tragedy befalls and out he goes. Um, here, you can write on screen, you would hear a splat, a sickening thud, if you like. So now, because we've done our, our wide, medium close-ups, we now cut back to the wide, okay? And there is one of our dead eggs. Um, so now we're back in the wide, and you go, okay, more information. Uh, egg, it has not gone well for the egg at all. Now, because we set this up early on, we know we can now have cut in on our medium of the castle, okay? That's why getting this establishing wide worked out is really important when you're storyboarding because you can paint yourself into a corner and suddenly realize, oh, I never put in the castle and, the king, and you'd have to actually pan over to it or something, which, which could break the flow. So we cut in, there's our medium of the castle. So now we know the castle is important. The, again, we're directing the viewer to the castle. And out come our king, horses, and men. Um, it doesn't specify how many the king has, by the way. It just says all, so I figured two was enough for budget reasons and schedule reasons. He only has that two. Was me. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, Dickie, Dickie told me that. Only, he only has two horses and two men. So, I, I think, oh, so they come off screen and then we cut back to a wide. So we don't always have to go into the close-up. When I was doing this earlier today, I was thinking, oh, it'd be great to go from this medium shot into a close-up, but there isn't really anything to show. So I cut back to the wide and now the boyos come in. So there they are. So they, they come into shot and they'll be looking at the carnage. Um, so this is the POV shot. This is used a lot. This is a point of view, hence POV. So point of view shot of the egg. I stuck in the horse ears and heads just to sort of indicate it's a POV shot. Again, it's enough for the um, previous artists. Previous artists, they will look at this and they will get a camera to match this as closely as possible. Um, it won't always work exactly as it is here, but it's enough information for them to kind of get that camera set up there um, for the animators to work off as well. And we cut back to the reaction shot. Now we see the two guys on the horses and they're looking at the egg. And then I thought in order to sort of pad out the story a little bit, it could be funny to cut back to another POV shot. And this is where you inject comedy into the story. So you go, we see the broken egg. We see the boys looking at the broken egg. We cut back to the broken egg. And we cut back to the boys looking at the broken egg. And this is basically saying it's helping with the tone. It's setting up the tone of the story. It's not super dramatic. We're not crash zooming in on the egg, you know, with, with, with uh, exciting music. It's more leisurely, it's more saying they don't really know what to do. And then in order to enforce that they don't know what to do, we add in a little acting beat, they look at each other, I don't know, and he's like, I, I don't know what to do here. And they go back to looking at the egg just to show they don't know what to do. And then I thought, cut back to the wide. We've already set up. One thing, an important lesson on storyboarding, you don't always have to go to a new camera. Um, live action would shoot all of this information in the wide shot they would film it all and then edit in the close and the mediums. When I see a storyboard where there's a new camera set up every single time, it drives me crazy because it doesn't mirror how we would actually make it in live action. Um, and this is probably the, the way to do it. It also simplifies everything for everybody because the lighters will have lit this wide, the camera will have set up already, the previews will have set up on this wide. So it's why not just reuse it? If it ain't broke, you don't need to overcomplicate. Absolutely. The boys, they, they don't know what to do, so they'll just be like, we're out of here, so they leave. And then you can keep it in the wide. You don't actually have to do anything. They go back in here, and they slam the door shut, which is a pretty final way, I guess, of saying they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times when I'm teaching this, uh, the kids will actually draw like a little gravestone, and, <laughs> and they cut to the gravestone. It's almost like a time cut from a week from now, and it's like, wow, okay. And they, he really isn't coming back. And that is Humpty Dumpty. So you'll see it's shot nine. So there's nine shots in total um, that we use to tell that one little story. Panel-wise, I'm not sure. I don't really have a panel count. Oh, do I? Uh, 39. So there's roughly about 36 drawings or panels to show those four or five lines in Humpty Dumpty. So you can imagine that now for an 11-page script. Um, there's a lot more panels to be drawn. 
And that is basically Humpty Dumpty in a storyboard form, a very rough storyboard form. Yeah, so yeah, I actually want to watch the, the movie now because you've made it look so exciting on <laughs> your drawing. I've had a little go at doing my... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did Insty Winsy Spider. <laughs> it needs no not... introduction. It needs no introduction. <laughs> my, we my need to get you a job. <laughs> <laughs> Wide shot me a bit close up. See, you can see oh, yeah. how unhappy the spider is because it's raining. Okay. A, a, this is it, right? This is it. I would say, here I am giving director's notes, right? I'm going to drive you mad. I would say in the close-up, you would probably need to go closer on the close-up. Oh, okay. I'll just do that. Yeah. There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did Jack, Jack and Jill went up the hill, so I started with my establishing shot of the hill. There we go. Yeah, just the hill with the sunshine, lovely sunny day. And then in the middle of these young people climbing up the hill, uh, you know, figures nice. just sort of moving up the pathway up towards the well. We got the closer shot on them sort of looking down at the well to get the water. And then I got to this part where he slips in a puddle, and then the oh, next no. part is him to go tumbling down the hill, uh, and then to Jill, for Jill to come tumbling after. Yeah, they are it. they are all gruesome, aren't they? They're all gruesome. We need a happy we need a happy fairy tale. All those sorts of things. They're all very dark. I should point out that uh, as well, storyboarding there is so many other considerations, including camera placement, crossing the line, how everything edits and cuts together. Um, it is such a complex art form. Usually they say a, a storyboard artist will take about 10 years to, to really, really, really master it, would be about 10 years of, of boarding. Not to put anyone off, um, not to put anyone off, but it can all be learned. It's just to be comfortable at the stage of getting a script and you have four weeks to do a script. So four weeks to do 11 pages to get to that stage of just being able to do it in four weeks generally would take about, about 10 years of, of, of practice and, and work. So there you go. Like, yeah, like I found the knack of it for just then thinking about it was how do you distill all of that motion and sort of like the interactions of the characters along with the setting in sort of one snapshot, you know, essentially every X number of frames. How do you distill those things down into the main points? And I thought that was really interesting mental process for me just now, like to take that fairy tale that I know back to front and go, right, what are the key points yeah. of action in this story is? That's, that's it in a nutshell. When you read a script, you're, you're reading it, and you're kind of thinking, oh, that's an important beat. And you'll I, I will actually highlight it and go, that's important, that's important, that's important. And then you can work backwards and you can say, that's really important on page three. How do we signpost it on page one? So, you know, if they're going to fall down a well uh, later on, maybe on page one, we can introduce some element of that or some some way of hinting that this may happen, you know? So that's, that's really it. Um, yeah, I say that's really it. It's not. There's about... 50,000 other things to to take into uh, consideration. <laughs> Absolutely. That's about right. That's really cool. I think almost every movie now we're looking at has some sort of animation or CGI or some sort of, you know, digital effect placed into it. What advice would you guys give to kids who are wanting to get into doing that sort of thing, whether it be creating fully animated films like you guys have been doing or whether it's doing CGI for live action films? How do you do that? Well, I mean... There's so many ways in. There's so many ways into the business, I'll be honest. Um, I mean, one thing is, like, you don't necessarily have to draw. There's a lot of disciplines now where you don't need to draw. I would say if you are thinking about getting into the more creative side of, of directing, certainly storyboarding, but even directing, even animating to a degree, it's really good to be able to just scribble something up and, and show what you need. So pen and paper is still very, very used. As for getting into the industry, like I say, I mean, I can tell you briefly how I got in, uh, the route I took. Uh, because it is it is an interesting one and it, it demonstrates I guess how varied the roots in are. I basically I studied 2D animation in college many many years ago. I didn't really like it because it was all hand drawn. It took forever to to tell a story and it wasn't really my thing. And then when I left college, I couldn't get a job in an animation studio for love nor money. So I started writing and was very lucky to get grants so I could make short films. But long story short, I uh, eventually had a frustration. I went and made a documentary in Angola, um, which was then listed as the worst place on earth. And I went over there and made a documentary about it, came back, and I learned editing um, to get the documentary done. So I learned how to edit, ended up doing live broadcast where I was filming horse racing for a living. And, and horse racing, on me, it's not my thing at all. Um, and 2D animation had kind of gone then, so CG had come in. I didn't know CG, and I was like, what, what am I going to do now? This is my life, watching horses go in circles and filming them going in circles. And as far as directing challenges go, there's not a lot to it. Uh, you know, camera one, two, three, four, repeat. So yeah, I uh, I was doing that. And then Brown Mike got in touch and said, you're an editor, because uh, they knew you had learned editing, who also knows 2D animation. 
So I came in as an editor. Now, editors don't need to be able to draw particularly or, or have an animation background. And that's how I got in the door was through editing. And then I, I did the editing. And then in order to learn CG, I got a film board grant, another one. I wrote a script and I said, I'm going to make this one in CG. And it was really jumping in the deep end. I didn't even know what a rig was at that stage. I had no idea about rigging or skinning or anything else. And I went and made it in CG. And that's really how I got my head around the whole CG thing. So that's how I got into the business. So I hope that is, I hope that does motivate and help people because cool. there's so many ways, you know, so many ways. It took me 36 years to get a job in an animation studio, as I always say. <laughs> <laughs> I was 36 before I got in. Um, so there you go. Not to put anyone off, but again, it does show you those people you read about who make a feature film at 22. I'm the flip side. I, I was really old when I got into the, the job I wanted to do. So yeah, keep at it. Keep at it. And was your route as circuitous as that, Richard? Or? I I went to animation college, so I actually did, you know, I studied animation in Dunleary. But I mean, the best advice I can have for anyone who's interested in the industry is, you know, start as early as you can, practice, practice, and practice, because the more you practice, the better you'll get. And just watch the best, you know, like watch Brownback, obviously, um, <laughs> Pixar, <laughs> Disney, you know, just watch all those kind of movies, and they just inspire you and show you how it's really done. There was an amazing movie I just watched on Netflix over Christmas called Claws, and it's it inspired inspired me you know like there's this just amazing work coming out all the time so keep watching the best and practice 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 and if you want to get into art college you know start gathering your portfolio pieces sooner rather than later you know and um, the more you kind of gather the better but then when you actually create your portfolio just less is more and we always say that when we're looking at show reels or anything just keep it to the only your best best work you know cut out all the fat and only show your best work Great too. And just regarding college, because it, that reminded me of a really important point. A lot of the people who work in Brambag never went to physical college. They they did a course online. They they did animating online, courses online, and that's how, how they learn. And I really think that that's the way it's going, is, is the expense and everything else of actually physically going to an art college for three years. If you have the drive and, and you're self-motivated, learn online. When I get it in CVs and portfolios, I don't really look at the CV. It doesn't, I don't really care uh, about, you know, what grades they got or whatever. It doesn't really matter. If I skim through the work and it's impressive, I mean, I, I'll, I'll happily talk to you. Um, so don't sweat it. Don't don't be worrying about not getting an A plus or whatever it is in, in your grades. It's, if you can do it, you can do it. I, I don't care how you, how you learned. <laughs> if you're good at the job, yeah, come on in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great, that's great. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for coming on today as well. That's really amazing and inspiring advice for young people who want to get into it. And I know it's such a coveted thing for young people to be able to do is make animation, especially digital animation, and do those sorts of things. So thank you very much. <laughs> so we've got scouting Nate here wants to animate Humpty Dumpty when he gets off the stream. Fantastic. <laughs> nice one. You've inspired. So you're already inspiring folks, guys. So thank you again for coming on. It was brilliant to have you. And hopefully we can see you again soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Great. Thanks Bye. very much. How nice. How cool was that? <laughs> oh, so cool. Yeah, that was amazing. I love that. That was really, really fun, the little story. But I'm going to finish my storyboard, right? I can't leave the thing half finished. So I'm going to, when I get off here, I'm going to finish it up. Uh, I feel like I, I really know how, what a storyboard is and how to actually make one now. Like, it, it was really, really useful advice in there. Absolutely. It's a thing. So like, I used to help young people enter film festival um, when I was a teacher. And so they always wanted to skip the storyboarding step. They're like, you don't need to do that. I'm like, trust me, it will save you so much time if you know what you want to make, like exactly what those, the guys were saying from Brown Bag. If you know what you want to make and you know what it looks like, putting it together is so much easier and you know what you can cut, what you can shift and change. And the tip that we got at the end there from Richard about be prolific, but only show your best work. I love yeah. that one too. That's the thing I'm taking away from that one then was yeah. that be prolific, see what sticks, make as much cool stuff as you can. But when you want to show people your work, pick your five or six best things and showcase yourself that way. So yeah. cool. And it was so great to see everyone else getting involved in the chat this week too. Like really great shout outs to Daily Push, Scouting Nate. Uh, we've got Turkey Tunes getting involved. Everybody jumping in on the chat this week. It was really great. Thank you for your contributions to the chat. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, and that's all we have time for this week. But you can always get in touch with us. Send us an email at dmah at raspberrypi.org. If you've made a storyboard today and are pla or are planning to do one later, then you can tweet a picture of it to us at raspberry underscore pie. 
Absolutely. And don't forget, make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube at rpf.io slash sub or just hit the little button and you'll be the first to know when we go live and you get more updates on other great content like coming here and learning to do storyboarding with professional digital animators, talking about space, doing all sorts of amazing coding with professionals. Uh, thank you all again for being here this week. We'll be back next week at the same time once again with Eben Upton. You may remember he's been on the stream before, founder of Raspberry Pi, who'll be doing some physical computing with us. Until then, stay safe. Until then, sorry, stay safe. Stay healthy. We'll see you next time. Catch you later, Beck. Bye. Bye.